Start sequence code. Up, up, down, down. L, R. We've seen Microsoft, we've seen Sony, and even some Nintendo, but I think it's time to experience the glory that was the 2010 Konami E3 presentation. This is an infamous one and a hilarious one. And to discuss it, I am joined by my good friend, Audie Surly. Hey, John. And there's a good reason why you're here today and why this isn't just the same as some of the other retrospectives we've done, because you were there. I was actually here. This was my first E3 uh, as an industry person, and it was actually the very first conference I ever attended in person. So that's, you know, it's quite a, this is quite the conference for your first one. I think for me it was an EA Play event in Germany like seven years ago, but uh, I would have loved to have seen this live, but I instead streamed this from the comfort of my own home at the time. It's actually interesting for me because uh, while I was there, I've not, never seen the feed, so this will be the first time I see what you saw. Ah, uh, yes, exactly. So, for those that aren't familiar with it, this is, I think this is the last conference that Konami did, or just about, or did they do, did they do another one? No, it wasn't the last. They did more, but uh, after this, uh, I think their style changed a lot, and what Th yeah, what defined what the was. conference would, would change after exactly. this. Exactly. So obviously they're showing some good games here, but the whole thing is that this is just insanity. So tell me then, like, how did you end up at this conference of all things as your first conference? And like, why were you there? Uh, so I was working for a publication at the time and I was becoming quite well known for being A, a good interviewer, and B, I had a lot of knowledge on retro games and then especially wrestling games. So I was kind of sent here on a mission to uh, do coverage. Oh, hold on. Did you see that they got the uh, lower thirds wrong there at the bottom? Did they? They, they had uh, Russell Simmons oh. <laughs> initially. So we are already <laughs> off to a good start here. And then they quickly faded it out and faded him <laughs> back in. But anyway, continue. Oh, no. So, yeah, I was just uh, sent here on a mission to find more out about this new wrestling game uh, in a time where new wrestling games were not that plenty. So uh, I was supposed to be at the Microsoft conference earlier in the day, but uh, I met up with Hip Tanaka and went to lunch with him instead. So uh, Microsoft was supposed to be my first uh, conference, but this ended up being it. That was interesting because at the Microsoft one, I think they gave out Xbox 360s consoles afterwards. They did. So it was like well, an Oprah Winfrey moment. Like, look at yeah, your I chair. Was, you get a Xbox. console, and you get a console. Except you, you're Richard Ledbetter. But uh, like I. Uh, when I got back from that lunch, I went to the Destructoid uh, room and just to chill out a bit. And everyone was like high-fiving each other and like, oh, I can't believe that happened. And I was like, what happened? It's like, everyone there got an Xbox. And I was like, oh, well, I got lunch with Hip Tanaka. <laughs> so I was happy. I mean, see, I would, have, I would have preferred the lunch. I, I also preferred lunch. I had an Xbox already, so it's fine. Xbox 360. I, so... I love that they have Frogger front and center there. And, uh, you know, Frogger was a huge deal, but at this time... I, I mean, it had know. been <laughs> revived. You remember, it was even on the GameCom, uh, but... Um, I mean, it was revived multiple times. Yeah. They were, this, ha this can't have been... Because you're right, the mid-90s Frogger was kind of like... I remember that having a big push. Yeah, the 3D Frogger. It came back as a yeah. character. <laughs> yes. <laughs> The uh, infamous Frogger character. We all remember and love him. Yeah. Uh, he's better than oh, Alpha Chicken. Oh, yeah. That's right. They they own Hudson. Yes, yeah, so they had acquired Hudson. And that's, you know, it was interesting to me to sit here because I love Hudson, of course. And they, you know, Hudson, uh, its history is so uh, diverse and interesting. They were one of the first big home console developer and had really, you know, spearheaded Famicom design. Uh, game design and you know PZ Engine all this stuff and here you know I feel like they've been relegated to kind of um, compilation uh, entity more so than anything else yeah I know what you mean kind of like Taito yes uh, it's better than Glee karaoke revolution well, get ready uh, get ready for this because I do remember uh, this oh, coming out so this this is okay so are they is this, is this, they're really, ugh. Are they starting the show with this? Indeed they are. Oh, yes. So, he, he you can see him kind down. of getting up the guts to go up there like, <laughs> oh boy. 
actually it's let's see maybe that's not the first game they're starting with after all uh def jam i think yeah it's i think it was one of the first ones i know which one you're talking about but no that's just the konami logo again <laughs> i think by this point uh, we were starting to get the impression that things were perhaps a little bit off off yeah the energy was weird in the room <laughs> yeah 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 exactly this is and I feel for them because these are exactly the oh. types of realities you face when doing stage presentations. But still, as some, yeah, as someone that has worked, you know, doing presentation at E3 and you know, just the timing aspect of these kind of conferences are not down to the decimal of a, si a second. You cannot waste any time. A lot of these people will, you know, be uh, doing this on second language, third language, even, and uh, it's hard to keep time, and you can't waste any. Oh man, this is this is, this is such an awkward moment. It's just <laughs> oh, so yeah, <laughs> you, you just know what's running through these people's heads. Oh, there we go. Oh no, nope. no, nope, almost. <laughs> I love that. See, everybody always remembers like the certain special moments in this conference, but like even right here, like we've already seen two flubs, and this this is great. So I, w I was lucky because I had a lot of friends in Konami at the time. So I got to kind of, you know, read their reaction as well after this. Uh, and, uh, you know, everyone wanted better. And I don't think anyone, you know, wanted to be this awkward necessarily. But, uh, uh, yeah, it was a special time. <laughs> Pretty much broken every rule in the book to make this game. We signed a multi-year. Yeah, this is, this is really weird. This is so weird. Our money from not a traditional publisher. We've recruited a web. Mobile. Where, where in the audience were you? By I the way, I was pretty high up. Ah, um, oh, so you aren't high. in any of the shots. No, no, I don't think so. I believe, I believe Richard was there too. This is before I knew Richard. And yeah, when, Richard was there. Yeah, it was before I ruined his life. We tried to rope him into this, but unfortunately, he was busy with you know important things like PS Five. Which, you know, personally, I would go with Konami E3 2010, but hey, what are you going to do? Yeah, you get more value out of this, I think, than the PS5. <laughs> <laughs> it's just the developers making stuff on PS5. For a moment, you're playing a console game, and you're sharing your gameplay instantly over the web with all yeah. your... I mean, they're all trying their best. I mean, they're just... Okay. There's technical issues. There's, uh, I can tell you that there was a lot of last-minute changes going on behind the scenes. Oh, like requests from on high to make changes to the presentation? Stuff like this and just uncertainty. I think there's a lot of uncertainty just because I, the reputation this has, at least from what I understand, is that this is a bad conference, which I don't think necessarily is the case because it's pretty fully loaded. There's a lot of games. There's a lot of things being covered in a pretty short amount of time. So today, by today's standards, it's a pretty stacked conference. Well, I mean, you're not wrong, but at the same time, like what they show for the most part, there's not much of it that's actually great. True, right? but this is that's E3 kind of the 2010, so the mainstream appeal of a lot of this, I think, is pretty apt. I don't know, I, I tend to be more optimistic, just generally, but... No, I, I agree, it's just that I think in 2010, uh, we hadn't quite come to the realization that Konami was going in the direction it was going. Right. You know what I mean? Yeah, they, they we had still, still saw them. some pretty good stuff. And Yeah, we still had hope. So I didn't understand it yet. So I was thinking, oh yeah, Konami's like my favorite publisher or one of them. Uh and I was really hoping that they were gonna, you know, blow the doors off of E three with this conference. They did though. <laughs> just an oh, either way yeah. expected. I, I still I still remember like two thousand nine and what and those weren't great conferences either though, but those on top of it I felt was kind of boring. So I don't know. There is a lot of funny stuff in this conference, but I also have some sentimental value. So I guess uh just yeah, some nostalgic glasses on. So my co founders Jamie King and Gary Foreman. This is going on forever though. I mean Yeah, he's really just kind of going isn't oh, he for over 10 years when they publish 4x4 yep Evo, they're a great development did you team. enjoy the Def Jam games I mean this is like a singing game right like the other Def Jam games were like there was like Def Jam Vendetta mm -hmm. and like other wrestling style from Aki slash fighting games from Aki right yep. like th those were interesting but that's not at all what this is so no. who really 
you know, wasn't, didn't just love hip hop, but is hip hop. Oh yeah, oh, here we 25 go. 25 years ago, that company was founded. It was called Def Jam. And See, th th this is where they're gonna pull out the correct lower thirds since they got it <laughs> wrong initially. There's something radically new with our man here, Mr. Russell Simmons. Thank you. Probably just didn't know that he had taken over Russell's the like, yet. may I get your hand off me? <laughs> <laughs> like, what are you doing? The new president of Konami. I was fucking with Nick about his socks and I guess it stuck. <laughs> anyway, um, one thing about this conference too, though, is we mentioned the Xbox conference that happened. Uh, I think it was the same day, and as I remember, it it kind of blurs together for me. But uh, so the energy in the room from the audience side too, they were kind of a lot of people. I felt was kind of um, poofed out. They were kind of you know a bit quiet and a little bit reserved because they had spent a lot of energy after that Xbox conference just due to the excitement and surprise of going home with an Xbox. So the awkwardness kind of goes a little bit both ways as and it's well. It's a game in a space where it seems to have been ignored. And So wasn't this the E3 where they had the Cirque du Soleil presentation showcasing Kinect? It might this be. This was, wasn't it? Like This I was the so. reveal of Kinect. Yeah. And all the discussion around Kinect, which, as we know now, um, a terrible idea. Well, you can cuddle a tiger. Uh, and yeah have you ever seen Shawn michaels cuddle a tiger no don't don't google it i kind of feel like if russell simmons had been invited on stage uh at the end of the conference he would have actually left the room before going on stage <laughs> like i'm not being a part of this <laughs> i'm out of here i mean that this <laughs> considering again as someone that has dealt with press conferences and whatnot for my career like it's so stressful and knowing you have the the, the time allotted you have oh yeah it's I, just, I believe you're it. constantly counting down in your head and as i mentioned like for, for me english is not my first language so when i'm speaking even on a video like this it takes me an extra second or two to kind of say the right word so when you're doing that concentrating on time making sure that you know because any second that you take away for the next presentation is going to ruin the whole show you basically put everything out of whack so um, I feel for the people on stage throughout this entire conference. At the time, I didn't quite understand, but now that I'm older, I, I have a lot of uh, respect and admiration for them uh, staying on stage, not running out the room, as you suggested. Yeah, for sure. A communication vehicle that, that uh, no one saw coming. And so Rapstar, you know, although, although it seems like, obviously, just by technology, it's the best karaoke game in the history of it Indeed it is. And, you know... That's why you have like super cuts, I think, generally of this conference on YouTube. I think at least there are, right? And uh, because there is a lot of lull to this. I, what I remember most from sitting in the room outside of those few moments that people do remember is basically just kind of sitting there as like, what's going on? I mean, this is interesting for someone, I understand. So I, I'm patient, but there's not that much more that can be said. So when are we moving on? <laughs> Yeah, I think a lot of other people too. I was sitting next to someone uh, from a Spanish publication, an older gentleman, and I've never seen anyone pay more attention to his watch than the stage, than this person. Yeah, especially like right now, at this point, uh, because of the presentation problems, they can't show anything. They just have a logo. Mm -hmm. uh, and they're just up there talking about it. I feel like if... I mean, we've been to many E3 presentations over the years. I mean, you're, you're usually tired, jet-lagged, everything. Yeah. To show up in a theater like this and just have guys talking on stage, especially about a game you're not that excited about, I don't know. It's, this is a this is a terrible way to kick things off. Yeah, as someone that generally has been talking about you know Japanese adventure games and whatnot, I know it's a, always a tough spot to kind of be the one talking about you know games that most people don't pay attention to. Yeah, I know exactly. So you start I mean, that, and that's you start rushing. You start making awkward jokes. You, you make in the beginning of a career especially you make mistakes like that and it's just when you have technical difficulties on top of it i don't know if i could do it this well as this guy no 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 they do they do a great job all things considered it's just that i feel like the order of the conference is a little bit off Oof. I mean, like yes. like starting the show with a game like this with no demonstration of the game until you know this far in it's not great 
Okay. This also showcases something uh, that we were noticing in Konami at the time was that the uh, you know casual approach that had been kind of set in motion by the Wii and such and mobile approach uh, was yes. very prevalent in Konami's approach to the video game That's industry. a good point. Uh, that's actually a really good context for E3 2010. It's like this is the point where uh, we almost lost the game industry that we know. Yes, I would say like for for people like us, like you know, yeah, phones were big, motion control was big, you know, connect and move were hitting, uh, things were moving towards like these weird social media driven ex experiences, Facebook games, like everything that was supposed to be the future. And there was genuine concern that like console gaming was over, yeah. Because to you, the point where that influenced Microsoft's own reveal of Xbox One X, I'd say. Yes. Where, and that that was the move that Sony made in 2013 that made a big difference. Is they actually embraced classic gaming and you know modern gaming, I guess if you will, uh, in a big way, and it paid off. But there was so much uncertainty about whether it was still viable at the time. So a lot of companies took this approach and to be fair i mean konami was making huge money in like pachinko machines and things like that already so it seemed like a good fit to just like okay we're gonna get in on the mobile <laughs> so, games and everything as well yeah. uh oh here we go so here we go my uh, reason for being there so i mean uh, we should talk about just how important this game really was to uh, everyone involved with it because this was uh, triple a which was in mexico's biggest promotion it was Mexico's most expensive video game production uh, so far, and it was done by a company called uh, Immersion Software, I think, if I remember correctly. And this was a time, really, when wrestling games had been, uh, you know, pretty much uh, uh, mon monopolized by uh, the American WWF or WWE. So here you had a new wrestling game coming in based on a large promotion that had some uh, mainstream appeal. Uh, it, you know, Lucha Libre is not the same as American wrestling, uh, but this had its own thing. It has its own heritage, very important heritage to Mexican entertainment because these wrestlers are real life superheroes going back to like El Santo, Min Mascaras and these people. So, I mean, when I was talking to the developers for this, um, they were very proud and they knew the importance they had with it. And it just so happens that when you get into the game and when you get into the development of it and larger public uh, larger publishers come into play uh, more demands are made from top uh, it just didn't have a chance to be the game it should have been and it became kind of like a slow paced uh, smackdown copy which you know lucha libre should have been more an arcadey very quick very in free form no pun intended uh, fight yeah so this is the uh, liaison for Slang, which was uh, the uh, publisher alongside Konami. Uh, I met this gentleman. Oh, okay. Uh, he has the belt there. We'll talk a little bit about the wrestlers on stage, too. Uh, I think the most striking one for many is uh, the skeleton man, who is uh, La Parca. He's, in fact, the second La Parca. The original one made his name in um, WCW in the 90s. And due to a copyright dispute, the character was given to this uh, gentleman who is in the costume now, so it's not the original, but uh, still a very good wrestler in his own uh, right. And the other man, uh, oh, okay. if I remember, the other man was uh, Silver King and El, El Guido, uh, who were there. And uh, I got to speak to La Parca a lot. Uh, in fact, he was kind of uh, <laughs> one of my E3 tag team partners, I suppose. Uh, so I got to interview him and talk to him about the game and you know, this conference as well. Unfortunately, when we talk about wrestling, we have to talk about passing, and uh, he passed away not too long ago. So, um, oh, that's a shame. A, a bit of a personal uh, affected me a bit personally that he uh, passed away. The original is still oh, around man. under the name of L.A. Park and still wrestles in uh, the American circuit. But uh, yeah, so I mean, so you have the importance here, and uh, also the booth. Uh, we haven't mentioned yet the Konami booth or the Triple A booth had a ring set up. Uh, where they were doing live uh, matches with uh, many of the stars from AAA, including La Parca. And uh, sure. that would define who was going to be the cover star, which is what this uh, gentleman is presenting. So this is kind of like a press conference for the upcoming match. See, th it's a really interesting concept, actually. I just think that the way that the way it's like, presented. this plays out on stage is pretty poor. And 
which is kind of odd like because you know these guys to to be good in the ring you have to be great at presenting but i feel like they just have no direction here they're just like go stand on the stage kind of thing and maybe do some stuff so what i can tell you about this is that first of all uh, konami had like a, a different company helping out with presentation right and originally right. from what i understand from talking to la parka they had really wanted to go and do what in wrestling is called cutting promos go up to the microphone present the product right uh, right. The problem had come up that they only speak Spanish, uh, and uh, due to time and everything, you know, we can't really have a translator on stage for these wrestlers to talk into a microphone because they will ramble. No, just it doesn't like, work for a promo, does it? Yeah, they'll do like me; they'll ramble forever. And oh yeah, that too. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, the decision was made to do this way in, like a fight way in, and this really didn't make much sense, did it? Uh, I mean, they do this, uh, but on stage here, it comes off. This comes off just as well as like your dad trying to explain his foot fetish to you. It's like the intention is well made, but I think the message gets uh, a little bit lost. And, well, uh, look, they did. They actually tried to do a promo shot here. They did. Uh, with they did subtitles. pre-recorded with subtitles. A uh, very quick one in the back room. So, but for those of us at home, this is what we saw. Like, what was happening on the stage during the segment? Uh, they were just looking, you know? slapping each other, and uh, this chop fest. Uh, you know, pushing oh, yeah, each other. Which there made, you go. And when I talked to Park about it, uh, I did an interview about this game, right? And just talking about his career. He, uh, he was a very well-spoken and soft-spoken man in real life. A really nice person. Uh, but uh, due to me having a little bit of understanding from Spanish being in South America in the prior years, uh, I managed to slip in the question what he thought of this. And my translator was just kind of like, oh, okay. <laughs> and Laparca thought about it and was like, well... I wish people took me more seriously, and he left it at that. And I thought it was so uh, cute that this man sitting in full skeleton garb was looking at me with soft eyes and saying, I just wish people took me a little bit more seriously. So they did do this match, uh, though, uh, to define who was on it, and I think Silver King won the match. Okay. What, was the game actually good, by the way? I so never the game wasn't played. that great. Uh, so oh, that's a for, shame. for the game, they constructed a interesting booth uh, to uh, present it. It was a gymnasium dressing room, which was modeled after a real-life Mexican arena, and uh, that came down to no air conditioning as well. And uh, the de developers were uh, noted of my presence, so I have to sit there for two hours because they wanted to pick my brain. So they were like, oh, just wait till the next, uh, next one is over and we'll talk more. And... Uh, I learned a valuable E3 lesson. Just say you have to go somewhere else. I think the other lesson to learn is that uh, don't get in this situation. Don't, you know, this is, this is, looks... I always wondered, did you ever play these Saw games, by the way? No, I wasn't into the movies either. Uh, Me neither. I, 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 I like a good classic horror movie, but I wasn't too interested in things that are just gratuitous. Uh, I'm not a big fan of violence generally, so I, they came off to me as kind of cruel. So these games, I just kind of, I think they're fairly good puzzle games from what I understand, but uh, I wasn't interested in this series. Well, I always thought it was odd because Konami, obviously it's Silent Hill and they're going to show a Silent Hill at this thing, but right. it just seemed like what, what a weird thing. They have this really excellent horror series already. Why do they need the Saw license? I mean, it makes sense from a Konami standpoint to have, because the Saw movies were making so much money at the box office. And I think these were primarily mobile games uh which uh no, wait tell. that wasn't what was not they? a mobile game these, these are console games are they console because i just remember saw from mobiles but maybe i'm wrong like as i no, said no, no. this is this was like on ps3 360 mm -hmm. i believe okay okay well any anyways i mean it makes sense to have the license to a big movie like this so i can see why they have it but you're right with silent hill you'd think that it's just konami specifically i yeah. thought that was a little bit weird Oh, it's John Williams. Oh, son. <laughs> yes. John Williams' son. Son, yes. <laughs> <laughs> so. Oh, boy. But, I mean, at this point, let me just tell you, I was just kind of looking around, not sure how to react because, you know, everyone was, everyone was doing this head move where everyone's looking around to see if, is that guy laughing? Is that guy reacting at all? Like, what am I supposed to do? Like, you start, like, thinking of the worth of human emotion because everyone is so confused about, like, wrestlers slapping each other. Uh, developers just talking forever. And you were forever. just sitting back like, oh yeah. Yeah, I was just smiling like, oh yeah, baby. Like, this is my jam. 
it's not my death jam but it's my lucha jam and uh, yeah i was very happy about that other than thinking that came off uh, kind of silly as i respected the wrestlers it, a lot and it, it did <laughs> yeah. so uh not sure what they should have done they probably should just not have chopped each other should have just kind of shown more of the game i think because the game was playable on so, the show floor yeah the thing is is i think what i've learned here is bringing up celebrities and you know th- you know athletes and the like on stage at these presentations it almost never works it always seems weird and cheesy like they're just setting aside just the time for them to come up on stage and like say or do something that's ultimately inconsequential to the game itself uh just because they it's like oh we have such and such we got to get them on stage but it never adds anything i always felt this was insufferable during like ubisoft and ea presentations Oh, yeah, especially when they bring out the Athlete of the Year. Yeah, things like it's this like, where it's just like... I Also, as a non-American, when they bring up these athletes... Again, I respect athletes of any kind, uh, being a martial artist myself. But it just... Yeah, it takes a long time. They're not, I've never quite comfortable in their own skin standing on stage. And I just feel bad. So I always feel like it's not always the best idea to bring them on stage. See, I love... Have you ever mentioned on here that... Uh, you actually did wrestling for a long time. Oh, why do you keep bringing up all these uh, horrible uh, facts about my life? But they're so interesting. Uh, yes, uh, I went to wrestling school for one year. That's so cool. In that, I was the worst wrestler. Oh wait, of all wait, time. wait. Oh, Tak Fuji. Here we go. <laughs> this, uh, I love Tak Fuji. <laughs> he, he was uh, doing the. He the thing is, is, this the is, this is such a funny thing, but he's so charming in this presentation. It's just, I love it. I got to meet Tak uh, this year. Uh, very quickly and uh let me just tell you that there's certain people i make an impression on you even if like i don't know him personally but meeting him i felt like i had met someone that i'm going to remember he was very charming very warm and uh i believe he got quite sick after this and he might have even been sick by this point Uh, i hope he's doing better today i actually haven't i think he is yeah Yeah. i I followed him on twitter and everything and elsewhere and he seems to be doing okay now yeah which is good and while this, I think this has become a bit of a meme because this is basically the only thing I've seen from this conference uh, feed is like him doing that, conducting the audience. Uh, but oh, that was... wait, that too. Um, you can compete in the online leaderboards and battle with armies of the more than one million troops. One million troops. Wow. <laughs> one million troops. That too, yes. Uh, but this was much needed to get some energy back, because I mean, you could you could definitely cut the tension with a knife, basically, and just yeah. Into- we're already like twenty seven minutes into this, and they've shown basically nothing. Uh, another thing I haven't mentioned is just how hot it was in this room. Oh, uh, geez. This is another issue that like, and I, I, if I remember correctly, this was the conference where they turned the air conditioning on halfway, and everyone got cold except me because I'm from Norway. Yeah, that's actually one thing about going to these shows that, you know, it's the temperature control in these rooms because it's usually, you know, it's summer and it can be pretty hot in L.A. at this time of the year. Uh, I remember last year when we went to go play uh, Contra the Rogue Corps. It was so hot in there that we almost were going to pass out. And everybody's like in the room. You see just sweat dripping off everyone's brow and it's just like, this is really bad. Yeah, yeah. (laughs) This is ang. Extreme. Oh yeah, here it is. Extreme. Extreme. <laughs> Heck and stress battle. Wasn't uh, Mizuguchi tied to the original 99 Nights? If I recall, I think he was. I think he was, yeah. I don't remember why though. Hmm. It was an early Xbox 360 game, hmm. kind of a Dynasty Warriors esque title. Had a really good soundtrack. Oh wait, here we go. The the same button like <laughs> X X S and Y Y Y and X X and Y Y Y again. You'll be sucked. That is true, Tech. I agree. He is quite right. charming. I mean, he is someone that has natural charisma. So, with the increasing the difficulty. And uh, yeah, it's really fun. He he, somewhat I think should have led Konami a little bit more uh, as a PR person. Uh, I mean, he is not a PR person, but he just fits that role so well. Well, he just has this goofy, lovable kind of presence. That's right. It's fun, right? He has that quality of someone like a Suda Fifty One. And the, the developers are themselves kind of personalities, just naturally. And please check out the latest 99 Nights too. 
It will be available in uh, June 29th on Xbox 360. Now, let's check see our latest trailer of the 99 Nights 2 Rock and Roll. Rated M for Mature. Okay, so this is the game. I've never actually played 99 Nights 2. Neither have I. Neither have I. I gather that it was somewhat mediocre, but I yeah. need to play it before I can uh, actually form an opinion on this. This was kind of similar to a lot of other games at the time, I feel. There's just kind of um, Man, to warish uh, brawlers. The early 2010s, uh, not a great time for games, honestly. I mean, there was some great stuff coming out, but it was also just... You know, beyond the stuff I mentioned earlier with the mobile revolution, the motion control stuff, which most of which I didn't like, uh, it just felt like games were trapped in a weird space somehow. I, I always felt in the 2010s and 2011 and such that the this era, PS3 and Xbox 360, had peaked a bit too early, and my issue with games at this time was just the performance was usually so bad. And I'm not generally one to sit there and limb my, my way for a game, but like, I just generally did not enjoy playing games during this era much because they just were so badly optimized. And I didn't, You're completely right about that, actually. I mean, yeah. the performance was just lousy in so many big games. Even People like when forget you, that today. Like, today we have a lot of 30 FPS games still, but at least they're mostly stable. Yeah, yeah. Back then, not even close. Oh, it, Automedius Excellent, which was a uh, pretty interesting shooter, kind of in the... It's excellent. Yeah, yeah. Uh, good friend of mine did music for this. So, so. this is... Um, man, you know all the musicians, don't you? I well, love it. I mean, I forced gumped my way through the video music industry throughout my uh, teens and 20s, so... <laughs> Everyone is my dear friend, TM. Uh, but yeah, Jake Kaufman worked on this. Oh, yeah, that's cool. That's right. Oh, okay, yeah. So, I didn't realize Jake actually worked on this one. Save the universe with nine lovely characters. But Automedius, excellent. Or Automedius is kind of, uh, seems like related to Parodius. It's totally wise. I mean, this was kind of a take But on a little that. bit, it, yeah, it's its own thing, but it's that kind of bright, cartoony, uh, over-the-top kind of shooter derived from Gradius, of course. Completely out of its element in the year 2010. Today, I think this game would have been... A cult hit, a limited run production, and uh, yeah. well remembered. Uh, but at this time, the response to a game like this, or any type of kind of retro game, revival or influence, uh, 2010 was not the year for that. So no. Also, I mean, this type of game, uh, doing these retro style games, but with 3D graphics, mm -hmm. I think most of them didn't work very well in terms of visual design. They don't hold right. up that well. Outside of, I think, buying a Commando Rearmed still looks awesome. It has a really cool look, but most others, eh, not so much. So I remember being very excited for this because uh, I'd heard about it previously that it was coming up and, you know, obviously through my friends, but... Shoot the core. Yeah, this uh, I was really excited that, like, this uh, potential, like, Parodius was back. Uh, I'm not a great All shooter right. player myself, but I enjoy them. Uh, yeah. Unless they're showing you kid, and I'm very good at them. That's true. Okay, <laughs> here we go. What do we got? Yeah. Oh, yeah. That's right. I remember this. Yeah, you're right. This is kind of out of place for this time period. But yeah. Thus far, this is probably the best of the game shown by far. And no one had a reaction to this, though. I can tell you that most people sitting there, I think the only person that showed any excitement for this was... Uh, Dale North, the editor-in-chief at Destructoid, I believe he was quite excited for this. Uh, but uh, generally, it, it just it, it flopped on the floor, unfortunately. Well, they're just showing anime here, yeah. like instead of the game, which is you know. It, well, anime based on Konami properties and characters, as you can see, there's yeah, a lot of nods. So for me, that was great, fun. Yeah, the Vic Viper there, that, that's fun actually. Yeah. I mean, I love these types of like animated sequences. They're fun, but I would have liked to have seen the game as well. Yes. Uh, it was playable on the show floor. Wait, here we go. Who's next? It is my pleasure to Let's introduce see. you all to a very exciting I project. I uh, Taylor is still at Konami. I'm not sure, but... Oh. Uh, this was on the family, 
as well as maximizing the uh, functionality wait. of the connect. Adrenaline, Adrenaline misfits. misfits. Did this material? I like this. That seems like it could have been like a late '90s arcade game, <laughs> but starring I a, it's probably a not rodent as good. or something like that. This this would have been an animal mascot game. Fire to work on. We hope that you will feel our passion in what you see and play today. I want to. I mean, but the, I mean, these types of titles, you know, showcases are kind of a bit of that fun that we used to have in the, in the era of NES and SNES and whatnot. So, you know, again. These were the type oh, of Oh, see this. What what he's saying here? Mm -hmm. No need to remember button combinations or look down at your controller. One, like you don't like you don't look down at your controller, right? That's all it's, I do. It's a thing that you learn very rapidly, and you shouldn't ever have to do that. When I was playing Last of Us Two, I just looked at my controller. I still haven't seen the game. Well, you know, <laughs> the thing about Connect that doesn't <laughs> work fundamentally is that. They say, oh, you don't have to press buttons or, or anything. But the problem is you have no guide on what to do. You just have your hands. You're like, all right, so what motion does the game expect? Right. So you're kind of at the mercy of the programming quality there. And, like, whether they're able to communicate, okay, here's the motions the game can accept uh, and how accurately can the game actually read those motions. And sometimes it worked okay, like, in games where they could sort of fudge it. The dancing games worked okay. The but one, anything with fidelity, especially there was that one from software published, uh, or maybe it was them that the steel it was Steel Battalion. No, it wasn't published by From Software, but I think they worked on. It. But the Steel right. Battalion game, where they had all those complex controls in there, and it mm -hmm. was almost impossible to control. I loved Steel, but I bought that huge original box. Remember with the joystick? Uh, you, I mean, you have the large box. I had it. I always. Oh, uh, I sold it. It's one of few of the things I sold just because it was so massive. And yeah, that's uh, a good point. At some point I moved, so it's just like this one uh, has to go to better home. So what do we what do we have here? Are they gonna show? Okay, trailer. Yeah, so here. Oh yeah. So the only Kinect wow. game that I was ever uh, I went to E3. I think the next year, in fact, um, to do coverage on a E3 uh, Kinect game which was Hulk Hogan's main event. Again, I was sent to do some wrestling coverage uh, and did not get to meet Hulk Hogan. I was uh, one of the few kind of publications that not, did not get the interview time with him. But I did oh. get to play the game, and I mean, in terms of Kinect games, it's probably the worst. And in terms of Xbox 360 games, it's probably the worst. Uh, so that was a, quite an interesting experience because, again, you know, I was kind of introduced as someone that had a lot of knowledge in wrestling games, and, you know, eventually I would make a book about this. But standing there trying to play Hulk Hogan's main event might just be the most awkward time in my entire life. See, I would have loved to have seen you if Hulk Hogan was there. I know, you. right? <laughs> like, that would have been amazing. Oh, here we go, here we go. This is this is my favorite part of the conference. <laughs> Dance I think Masters. This is they, try, they try to have him do... Uh, basically speak english phonetically so it doesn't quite work but the the what i love is the uh the play between these two guys mm -hmm. right like they're meant to be like talk, talking back and forth <laughs> but <laughs> doesn't quite work hi everyone my name is now Meyer, and i'm the producer for dance dance revolution and dance masters and this is thomas nagano who is working with me on this project Today, we prepared an exciting announcement for you all. Oh, come on now. Just don't tease him. Let's get on with the announcement. Oh. Konami is talking dancing to a full new rebel. So wait, you're telling me that it's going to be Dance Dance Evolution? Mm -hmm. Dance Dance Evolution? No, no, no. We would be using a mat and more. This basically looks like me and you on a Saturday night. <laughs> Actually, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no. Uh, yeah, I mean, see this, they're, they're trying to do this banter here. Yes. But it <laughs> doesn't work. Like scripted banter like this doesn't work, especially in this case. Like it just, it, it's hilarious though. I love it. I mean, at least again, it brought some energy back into the room. I think these people kind of got that. No, I, I yeah. genuinely love it. I think it's great. This is so fun. It adds a lot. It, this game we can't. Oh, except for they showed the camera zoomed down to somebody using their phone. Oh, like, dude. Oh. I said, like I said, I was sitting next to this old Spanish gentleman uh, who was just looking at his watch. He was not taking notes and he was complaining to his person next to him. 
that just kind of like this was a waste of time and again it, it's a bit unfortunate but you know look at this so, man smiling i mean how can he not smile i'm fairly certain that this was just like they were just like yeah this is just a scripted thing right oh, they're pretending be. to dance oh, yeah. to the game uh because one actually trying to do connect on stage would on be a stage nightmare. with these lights and oh stuff? my goodness you couldn't do it, it. Wouldn't, it wouldn't work it would be a mess so it's funny that they're trying, but I, I can see why. I wish they brought Hulk Hogan to do this, though. Man, I love how Naoki really gets into this, though. Oh, yeah. I mean, he's again, like super. He and Tak and these people, I think they got kind of like, this is supposed to, I think the idea of this is just that it, be a bit over the top, be a bit personality, be a bit fun. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. You know, everyone else is kind of dry. It's all like the suits and corporate and we're, you know, we're the gamers. Worked. It would have worked if the th segments between this mm -hmm. had actually been effective, right? Yes. Okay. Look at this part of the dance. <laughs> that's <laughs> that's so weird. The worship. Are you a oh, good and dancer? Then he just by turns the around and starts talking to the crowd, and it yeah, just yeah. Keeps going. But he's still. Am keeps I a good going. dancer? Yeah. Are you a good dancer? No. You know what, John? <laughs> Do I look like a good dancer? I, I challenge you to Star Wars Connect. You and I, the Han Solo dance. Oh no. Oh, Coming no. to you, twenty twenty one. Not sure about that. Le leave a comment if you want to see the start of Han Solo challenge. Your friends come and play, and then you I wish Rishiru was here. Oh, then I would have challenged <laughs> him to the Han Solo challenge. Exactly. That's it. I mean, and again, uh, this is not a game for me. I mean, this goes into the things like Just Dance, which was catching on. And I think still to this day is being released on the Wii. And uh, just... Um, it takes a bit too much time, I think. But I also, let's remember, though, that these press conferences are generally meant to generate interest from publications like newspapers and TV stations and these kinds of things. Because we're going to get our information from the internet anyway, by 2010 well, especially. Yeah, and that's these are meant to ge help generate interest for the people that are going to put stuff on the internet usually that but also a lot of this audience and for any press conference for any event at e3 you've been to press packet packets right where you go with other oh, publications yeah. there's always like parental groups and mother yeah, blogs yeah, and true, these kinds of true. things there's so many of these and while i understand most gamers shouldn't sit there and be like well think of the mothers it's just like well they are there and they have to generate interest to everyone and this can be seen as a bit misguided but again i mean this is for them to generate interest and money for all their products so something like this everyone can dance except you apparently so it's like of course they're going to show off dance masters because anyone anyone can play this hulk hogan could play this yeah i would love to see that actually yeah, yeah. that would be the true main event <laughs> it's the true <laughs> dance masters the true main event starring Hulk Hogan and Richard Ledbetter. All right. So they're so focused on it's just your body, no controller for like right. everything connect. And it just isn't it, uh, dancing games though, are pretty much the one genre that seemed to work pretty well in there mm -hmm. because it, you could kind of fudge it. And just, if you, you know, got within the realm of the pose, the game asks you to do, it usually worked. Some of this technology used in this game though, uh, actually came from a wrestling game called the rumble roses. Yeah. Uh, Konami had been very involved in doing tech for that to do very fluid motion, uh, capture. And that was actually used in their music games. That was kind of where that rumble roses tech would go after that series ended. So, uh, I mean, and you can see if you know, like rumble roses, XX, on 360. If you look at this game and then look at uh, uh, Rumble Roses, there's some there's some graphical and motion uh, similarities. So they're off stage. Okay, what's what's Exit next? Stage, right. Everybody's excited there. Okay, we got an ESRB rating. Oh no. Oh yeah. No no. Yep. Ugh. America's favorite underdogs. Yep, we're at this point now where it's just back to back with these uh, cash roll games. And again, I totally understand why they're there. Well, okay, you you say that, and you're you're right, but 
Konami has a rich history with music games. They're mm-hmm. you know that very well. Beat They're Mania awesome. And, yeah. Beat Mania, Dance Dance Revolution, you know, Drum Mania, I guess. Mm-hmm. All Guitar kinds freaks. of stuff. Guitar freaks, yeah. Uh they they were huge in this space, but this was the time of uh guitar hero and rock band and Konami was trying to do things differently and mm-hmm. I think it just didn't work. It didn't feel authentic in the way that their previous games did. No, I mean, those, but the difference there, though, is that, like, be, uh, Guitar Freaks and the earlier music games are combo games, basically. It's all about structuring these That's large right, combos. Yeah. So they're, they're still fundamentally game mechanics that people can recognize. It's just that you can immerse them with music, which is generally the second passion of many people. Uh, when you talk about something like Glee Karaoke, um, I mean, it's the passion of uh, teenagers all around the country, but uh, I certainly wasn't one of them. So Same. I did have SingStar on um, PlayStation 2, and I could bang out a pretty good Avril Lavigne if I wanted to. I also had long hair at that time, so I looked like her. Sing duets, or even enter an interactive scrapbook mode. Man. This 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 period for music games was so interesting. Harmonics was like on top of the world for a decent period of time, right? Mm-hmm. I mean, I loved their games going back on PS2, so like Frequency and the like, right? But um, they hit it big with Guitar Hero and then Rock Band, and they were so big for a while. It was like the premier thing. You wanted them on stage at E3, everything, and then. The genre just kind of dried up. People got tired of plastic instruments, and the whole thing just went away. Yeah, it took too much space when you grew older and you had kids. That's what, that's at least what I heard from friends. I was always just like, yeah, that was fun, but it just takes too much space now. And I don't have time. So Wait. Ooh. Oh. Yeah, this is just uh, about like the popularity and whatnot. And It's I mean, glee still. Yeah. But you can definitely see here what they're trying to do. They're trying to get over just how much phenomenon this is. But, um, yeah, oh karaoke boy. games. And uh, I was never too good at... I play real-life guitar, or I used to. Um, but playing Guitar Hero and whatnot, I didn't get that same satisfaction that I kind of get from playing real-life instrument. So I think I just well, kind of... I mean, it's not <laughs> that's not the point either, but I think I just kind of missed the mark on it. It's my fault. I'm not. That's my yeah. point. It's just that... I think I misconstructed a little bit what the game was supposed to give me. And yeah. I was a much younger person then, and arguably uh, more stupid then than now. So It's really just, they just adapted the frequency design, mm-hmm. you know, PS2 game frequency. They took that same concept and they married it with an actual yeah. different controller, which was I have in the shape a, of a guitar. I have a lot of respect for those games today, especially, because a lot of, they're a bit of the Tony Hawk of their era in the sense that they introduced a lot of... Uh, Oh no, I, I'm just feeling my stomach, my stomach sink again. Uh, it's all coming yeah. back to me. Uh, but no, I was going to say, Tony Hawk, uh, Pro Skater, remember that was kind of like, that introduced the whole generation of people to ska and punk and, you know, these musical genres. Uh, and I feel like Guitar Hero continued that by kind of introducing people to rock, melodic rock, and, you know, a lot of different musical genres as time went on. So I have a lot of respect for them uh, in the music sense that uh, it broadened people's enjoyment of uh, music. Yeah, for sure. This though, I mean, uh, this uh, this doesn't broaden anything other than my. This, this feels like the end of a Ubisoft anxiety. conference. <laughs> yeah, this is uh, this this is a Ubisoft moment of any, and uh, I mean, everyone was just sitting there and pretending they weren't seeing this and no offense to the people on stage they do their best they can and they're talented people but it just isn't the crowd for it you know yeah. much like it's not the crowd for slapping each other in the face <laughs> like the luchas i mean that's really what it comes down to is konami failed to read the room they should have sent the, the luchas whole... out now and had yeah. them yeah. slap the kids <laughs> oh. so uh, That's ta- the thing about these conferences and we do these videos and you think about it, you know, doing these presentations is very difficult. It takes oh, yeah, so yeah. much effort and planning and just, it's ridiculous. So I'm, even when a, you have a bad conference, there was still so much work that went into it. So, you know, I always feel bad in that sense. But here I feel like they're actually kind of just let down by uh, Konami's really poor lineup 
for the show. I was glad I got to see Carrot Top singing, though. But, like, well, this, uh, I mean, what strikes me of this, though, is this is a production. I mean, this is in the middle of the conference, the diversity of this conference, and getting this to actually happen, uh, it takes a lot of work. So it's like the effort is there, but a bit That's misguided. true. We've come a long way since that first guy got up on stage and couldn't, uh, couldn't show his right. game. <laughs> couldn't show the game. <laughs> so, but, yeah, wow. While this is going on, let me tell you a quick story about the Luchas. Uh, so just we can get oh, yeah, forth. please. So the people don't have to watch this. Uh, when that Lucha match was happening, uh, right before it, I had been introduced by a friend to uh, Reggie Filzame at Nintendo. So I got to have a quick conversation with him. And generally in real life, I'm not someone that takes up too much time. So I'm just kind of like, oh, big fan. You know, really respect the work you do. And he's like, uh, talked a bit about Zelda and stuff. And uh, before he was leaving, he made a quip to me, kind of like, well, I got to go and take some names and kick some ass, you know, Reggie style. And I said, well, you should join me over to the Lucha match and just uh, do a run-in. And he was like, wait, Lucha match? And it turned out that Reggie was a little bit of a fan of wrestling. And not a big fan, but he was, like, intrigued by the fact that there was going to be a wrestling match going on right now. So he took, he actually did it. Uh, he... Uh, managed to get us to take a shortcut with an escort for him to go to the other hall to check out this wrestling match. So I got to spend uh, some time escorted by Reggie walking to the ring. Uh, he was being nice though because I think he actually had a meeting there so this was just a convenient way of kind of like not making it into abrupt and awkward end to our meeting. Right. But it really speaks to Reggie that uh, I think people you know, love him and hate him. I don't know for what reasons, but I've seen you know, both opinions. But let me just tell you that he was someone that took a lot of time to anyone. Didn't matter who he were. And uh, him and Iwata, Iwata especially, I got to meet. And he was a person that uh, we will never see that type of person ever again. Yeah, that is that is sad, actually. You're right. I never got a chance to meet Iwata. Um, uh, but... His handshake is the softest of any handshake I've ever gotten. That's as much as I can say about him. Oof. Softer than this rock. <laughs> well, Iwata was... Um, this, this somewhat, is, I can't believe this, this is, is still going sorry, on. Sorry. This is still <laughs> going on. Like, what look is at the guy. Look here? at the guy in white. He's leaning this on is, a chair. Head this down. This is absurd. <laughs> that took like... Three hours. All right, we're almost done. Oh, oh, Jesus! To tap it applause. I think Richard Ledbetter was actually giving it a standing ovation. We're at our booth at three o'clock for a special encore performance. <laughs> no, <laughs> no, please. That's what I have to follow. Whoa, what happened there? Uh, if, uh, this seems to be a slightly edited version, so it had some fade out and cut in. Director of marketing for Hudson Entertainment. I'm happy oh. to show you. Four titles that Hudson will be releasing this okay. fall. Okay, Here's Hudson a look titles. At the first one. Yes. And what do we, we have? I was okay. really excited when they announced this, by the way. Like, he's, you know, a huge long-time fan of Hudson. Yeah. And, uh, I mean, at this point, they had been bought out, uh, which is really oh. sad considering who they were. I mean, they were such an important developer and pioneer to home consoles. Uh, in Japan, they're very much uh, someone that could be put on the level of a Nintendo. They didn't make their own hardware necessarily as much as Nintendo did, but they were someone that were on the forefront of that technology constantly and helped Nintendo tremendously in the beginning of the Famicom to develop games that were not arcade ports, but had foundation in home entertainment so that playing a game and how it was designed was meant to be fun over and over again in a home setting, which the arcade games weren't yeah that's right so hudson's history is one that i think westerners are not always quite aware of because we're we tend to think bomberman and we tend to think uh, yeah and i mean obviously they things. contributed to the pc engine development and they had a lot of software on the pc engine right a ridiculous amount of games actually and many of them are really really good and, and they were still releasing stuff for other platforms as well yes i mean they were everywhere and they were you know a huge Third party for every console it was a it was a it was a great honor to have them on there because you know you get quality 
And uh, by this point, what kind of struck me about this when Konami picked him up was that you, you come, Hudson comes with Bomberman especially, but also like Takahashi Meijin and other titles like this, where they have characters, mascots, IPs that are worldwide uh, recognizable and should have really been integrated to Konami's uh, identity, its DNA, properly. But uh, Hudson, for the most part, was relegated to these kind of anime adaptations yeah, and sadly. compilations, as I said. Uh, I think there was some WiiWare titles based on Takahashi Majin, Adventure Island for Westerners. But uh, uh, this, though, what? Deca Sports. Did you remember these games? Um, vaguely. They were I, actually um, very good. It's not a series I've played much of, though. I mean, these were kind of like the alternative to uh, Wii Sports from Hudson, uh, Deca Sports 1, 2, and 3. And uh, okay. they were quite fun. I mean... Uh, yeah, I, I can believe that. The technology wasn't as responsive as, like, you know, the fine-tuned Nintendo experience. See, but I will say, I, I you know, talking about motion control stuff, I really did enjoy Wii Sports, and that, that specifically Nintendo nailed the feel mm -hmm. in a way that very few other developers did. Well, I mean, it sold the entire console, its entire life, <laughs> its entire generation. Yeah. I mean, based on that, they, yeah. Well, Wii Sports, even up until the Wii U, was like the game to showcase that technology. Ugh. So, Deca still, Sports, Deca Sports still yeah, Deca Sports, all right, but Beyblade and Deca Sports Three. It's not, not what, what Hudson should Hudson. be doing. I mean, they should have come Wait, out with. And they did do um, a Bomberman eventually, but that was Bomberman That's Zero. Right. The, uh, oh, I think that had already been released at this point. Act right, Zero? I just mean after the uh, generation. Yeah. During this time oh. Uh, time period. Oh, Deca Wait. Sports Freedom. Yep. Uh oh, is this for Connect? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Oh man, Connect was just. Did this ever release though? Like, uh, that's a good question actually. Because I I have the Deca Sports for Wii, but uh, I don't know if I ever saw this. Uh, I didn't make it a point of picking up uh, good games for the Kinect. I only have one. Yeah. Hulk Hogan's main event. <laughs> it did release. I did it? Okay. So. Yeah. So. Didn't Rare do some sort of sports compilation of they Kinect did. as well? They yeah. did. Kinect Sports and then mm -hmm. Kinect Sports Rivals. And Rivals was actually kind of neat for what it was. I just didn't like playing games in that way. Mm hmm. Man, this what a weird time in we games this was. We still get these trailers, though. When I look at this, these types of trailers are still kind of being made, though. Like that kind of, like, uh, house party, motion yeah. troll parties. Yeah, but that, yes, you're right. But, man, they were off. They were used so often back in, back at this oh, time yeah. period. We picked the very best sports from past deck of sports games for this title. He's, he's so bored. Just the way he speaks, he just has this like very flat. <laughs> we picked the best deck of sports titles to include in this package, and then there's going to be really good for Xbox 360. So please well, enjoy. I mean, as a Hudson fan, I, this is how I felt too. Which is kind of looking at this. Like, <laughs> yes, you know, that's true. You know, is this what we're doing? Mm. Oh, let's see. But then, oh, did you this... play this game? Is this what I think it is? Is this Lost in Shadow? Yes, I did play this game. I love this game. Yeah, I thought it's pretty good. My expectations were a bit too high because I saw this something. Oh, it's like Eco or something. It, it has similarities. I didn't enjoy it as much as that game, but it's still a very interesting game. And looking back, it's kind of one of those forgotten, uh, unique Wii games. Because the Wii, uh, as much as I dislike the motion control stuff, there was so much more to the Wii than just that. Right? Oh, yeah. I mean, it had a lot of classic software that's today... Uh, unfortunately, it would be hard to get into just due to the setup that uh, system and the uh, video quality for many. But yeah, you're right. Like things like this. And uh, there was the uh, Lost Winds game on WiiWare, which was super good. Oh, and, yeah, Lost Winds was cool. Uh, this That's to me, though, I was so excited for this. And it kind of, it actually kind of lived up to my expectations because I think I mentioned before on DF, but one of the most inspirational games for me are games like Another World, flashback to this cinematic platformer. And to me, this is a continuation of that. Uh, it doesn't play as similar. Uh, you know, Another World especially is much more minimalistic. But the idea of less is more and like the fact that the whole thing is played via shadows and the interplay between foreground background, these kind of things. Uh, I really loved it. Uh, this is the kind of game design that inspires me. Yeah, I tend to agree. It's a solid game. 
I bought this on day one on the Wii. Yeah, sir. But I'd forgotten about it until just this moment. Wow. I'll have to play that again sometime. The Shadow's main goal is to reunite with his physical form. A massive tower in the land... But yeah, I mean, after this, though, um, yeah, Hudson is basically just a, a brand to put on a compilation for a while. Uh, or just kind of like a, a relic in Konami's library. And uh, it's a, it's a That's shame. right. Uh, I hope one day I can kind of bring them back. Lost in Shadow will be available exclusively on the Wii this fall. All right. Now, I know none of you came here today to hear someone from marketing speak to you. Yes, As luck true. would have it, the producer of each <laughs> one of the games I presented are in the Konami booth this week. Please feel free to ask them the hard questions that marketing never answers. He has a little bit more glimpse in his eye now that he's talking about Lost in Shadow, though. That's true, and I don't blame him. <laughs> Okay, back to the Konami logo. What's next? I wish they had brought back oh, the you know what's next. Konami logo. Glad to have you all here today to share with oh, us yes. on the official great... announcement for the next Silent Hill. So game. this, uh, <laughs> this was bizarre. Yeah, this was bizarre to me to sit and watch, and I, I don't know how it comes off on camera, so I'm excited for this. Uh, but uh, there was something going on here that uh, I picked up on. I think a lot of other people kind of picked up on, at least from my angle as I was sitting. I'm up in the corner yeah. somewhere. Uh, where the gentleman speaking right now uh, is going to take a drastic turn in, the <laughs> in his presentation. And, uh, yeah. Is it the I mean, stare down? It is a stare down. <laughs> yeah. It is what I call the Richard Ledbetter look, because that's how he looks at me every time you invite me on this channel. <laughs> oh, no. Audie's on here again. <laughs> and he just stands behind us and stares like that. Oh yeah, here we go, here we go, this is it. ...what horror games are meant to be, so I we're borrowing this. influences from what the uh, <laughs> successfully executed in the past. The yeah, I'm not disturbing really, creatures, I'm the mind-boggling sure, like... and mind-bending psychology <laughs> that transports players to an alternative nightmare world. And in the process... We're the evolved. camera angle, the way with the low field of view as well is so yes. perfect. Increasing right. it as we did in Homecoming, or removoving it all together as in Shadow. He, he, he kind of stands there stiff. Uh, you can't really see it from here, but he's kind of straight, and it, it just was a bit bizarre sitting there. Again, it was kind of one of those moments where you're looking around the room and just kind of like, um, all right, well, what am I supposed to feel now? And apparently very perplexed and puzzled is so, the answer. I actually did kind of enjoy Downpour. Yes, so I wanted then. to mention like, I don't that. think it's... It's not as good as the originals, for sure. No. But I still think it's an interesting game in its own right. The only problem is that when it launched, uh, it suffered from severe technical performance problems. Like, really bad. Yeah. The only way to really enjoy it... This didn't get a PC version, I don't believe. So, the only way to enjoy it now is if you play the Xbox 360 version on Xbox One. It mm. solves all of those problems and it runs completely locked at 30 FPS. So it is fine now, but at the time, and I played it on PS3 first, and it's Unreal Engine 3, which is never good on PS3, uh, it was a mess. I mean, it even runs poorly on this prepared scene. But yeah. like, the, the thing about Silent Hill for me as a series is that I, I enjoyed them individual a lot. I loved the second game. I uh, loved this third game. Uh, the uh, first one didn't play much and the subsequent ones didn't really play that much, but I've always enjoyed them individually. So I don't have that connection to Silent Hills as many fans do, where like it's this kind of, you know, oh, Team Silent and whatnot, which wasn't really a thing as I understand. Uh, but... Well, they had... They had, they had some core remarkable members. Remarkable art direction. They right. had Akira Yamaoka's amazing soundscape that he would craft. Right. Uh, and there was Which just... continued, though, for many games. Yeah, but not in this one. Not this one. But, but I always um... felt, when I played this, though, I played it just as a game, right? And I wonder yeah. if even if it was called Downpour, uh, people would remember this better as, as a game, because I felt like the writing wasn't that bad. I enjoyed the characters. No, I enjoyed I agree. the locations. And I enjoyed the gameplay, most of anything. So this is one of the few good memories I kind of have from playing a game brand new during the PS3, Xbox 360 era, because it wasn't necessarily the one where I was most active on like picking up the newest game. Uh, I, I was working in a publication at the time, so I kind of played what was given to me, and that was it. And uh, I played this, I picked this up, and really enjoyed it. So I'm surprised to hear that some people kind of treat it as a bad Silent Hill, because I... I, yeah, I don't have I that don't connection to the series, so for me, this is a good game. 
as a big fan of the series, I don't think this is a bad game. I mean, it has its issues, I'm glad to but hear I still, that, I did enjoy it. I did enjoy it. Yeah, yeah, I really enjoyed Downpour. And uh, another game I really enjoyed was uh, Shattered Memories on the Wii. Oh, yeah. Uh, that one, I felt, was an amazingly impactful experience playing it over and it over was. again. Uh, the thing is, though, with all of these games, after the main series was basically finished and from the Japanese developers, those original four games were known for pushing sort of the technical boundaries at the time. Really high-end visuals and just like a look and feel that was like polished to a mirror sheen. And then all of these Western developed Silent Hill games all exhibited severe like technical issues that and they ne never really looked that great. And so that was disappointing. And I think part of the reason is that this is when they moved to the larger map model, like the older Silent Hill games. They yeah. would basically load on a per room basis. So you'd enter a room, it would do a quick loading screen, you're in that room, right? Where with these games, they tried to make them a continuous world, which is obviously more difficult to do. Mm -hmm. And as a result, the actual fidelity was somewhat reduced. Like the characters in all of those, these games, post the PS2 ones, the models are worse than they were in like Silent Hill 3. This game also had some interesting like uh, dimensional changes too. Yeah, I agree. Like the this is a game that would have worked very well on PS5's SSD solution, don't you think? The fact that you uh, like, can dynamically this concept, change. Yeah, they could have done more with the concept. I still yeah. like this idea of like warping the environment as you play. I mean, we've seen it before though. It's possible to do on older hardware, of course. Oh yeah. It's just, you could do more with it going forward yeah so a lot of uh, my friends names on that credit list so um, many of them not that konami anymore though unfortunately but i mean yeah this you know another silent hill and at this time we were getting silent hill kind of frequently so uh it's kind of weird today yeah. to say but i mean at this point uh the response to this too and the uh, you know at the conference was kind of a little bit tepid as well just kind of like it's another Silent Hill, and uh, I think if you said that today, you know, there's another Silent Hill, people would, you know, fly off the roof. But at this well, point, they, they almost yeah. nailed it when they did release that PT thing and announced Silent Hills before everything kind of went downhill at the studio or like right. at Konami. Uh, PT was really, really engaging. So I remember this very well. Ah, uh, yes. Never dead. Hey, he's back. He's back in a trench coat. And again, you know, this... Oh, no, I know this part, yeah. Phonetically, and again, <laughs> the kind of predetermined banter. Jay from Konami Japan. Yeah. And first we'll save any <laughs> explanations for later, right, Shinta? Yes. So, uh, yes, This is why please. we don't pre-prepare our jokes, because our jokes are bad regardless. So we can yeah, just do exactly. it on the fly. Uh, Never just Dead, though. Uh, this is a game... Uh, I only played it at the show floor i don't remember anything about it i think it was done by rebellion but i might be wrong oh uh, uh, that does sound is it rebellion uh, maybe i, I we're either way I, I don't remember this well we're big fans of rebellion for their works on the atari jaguar yeah so. that's true <laughs> and asterix on the game boy uh, color so I, 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 I seem to recall this is a rebelling game, but what struck me when I was sitting there... Yeah, you're right, it is. It is. Um, yeah, developed by rebellion. Uh, but um, what struck me when I was watching this is just kind of like, is, isn't this Bayonetta? And uh, it kind of has like this invincible main character and quippy uh, sidekick. And uh, this, this is graphic style, kind of... I don't know, it felt very Bayonetta to me. Is that sense of anticipation? Oh wow. Oh yeah, the... Yep. Wasn't the a big thing about this game though, was like uh, destructible environments and whatnot? Well, and that your head could be knocked off. Uh, and you could quite replace simply, it or something? Very clean and simply. Yeah. So, I mean, this game to me though, kind of just... This is such a PS3 era game, isn't it? It looks like a PS3 game, it talks like a PS3 game, and it tastes like a PS3 game. It's just kind of... The color scheme, the type yep. of game, the characters. This is pure PS3, isn't it? Yeah, the performance. Um, yeah. Just, See, though, one that has a little bit of a, I guess, in this vein of like visual style is um, Shadows of the Damned, but mm. I love that game. I think that oh, was a yeah, really entertaining. Yeah. 
That was a good game. Really yeah. well written, very entertaining. What a great game that was. This, looking at the trailer, because now it's been, you know, 10 years since I played this at the floor, but, oh yeah, Rebellion's logo. Uh, but oh no, uh, looking at it, it looked like a mix of, like, uh, Max Payne and Devil May yeah, Cry. Yeah, exactly. Here they go, here they go. This is the best part of the whole show. This is never that. I hope you like it. Uh, I wonder if at this point he was thinking, should, should we still go ahead with this? <laughs> you know, when like, you contemplate the meaning of your life in front of people, it's always bad. Yeah, rebellion. Yeah, that's and true. I'm staying in Oxford and working with uh, them as a producer job, and also a radio game it's designer. It's hard to get these words out. Hey, Tommy, uh, please introduce yeah, yourself. Hi, everybody. Um, oh. My name is Tommy okay. Cigano, and I work with the development team as PR in, from Japan. So, as you guys were able to see in the trailer, Here we Rice, go. our hero, gets dismembered during gameplay. Yes, he does. But he gets it's all dismembered. Right though, because he can pick up his body parts and limbs and. Um, hey, Tommy, just are you okay? With... Yeah, she's like, I don't what? What's wrong with you? Oh. Hey, oh, Tommy, yeah. uh, what are you doing? Sorry, it's strictly sorry. confidential I mean, yes, that we have a real model for this title. Put it back, put it back, put it back, put it back. Put it back. <laughs> <laughs> Oh man! See, this is so silly and fun, though. I, I love mean, that, they, though. That's, they that's... Do, they know what they're doing. I mean, yeah. they know they know how this comes off, and they they they're just embracing it. Rather rather to embrace it than just kind of st stand there and be above it, you know. Just these these. I mean, fundamentally, fun. the big issue here is that they just don't have the games to back it up. No, like you can act like like a doofus on stage just fine and have a good time, but uh. They didn't. They didn't bring their wares, so to speak. Did never did like I know it was released, but like, what did it succeed? Was it a successful game? Do you know? Uh, I don't think. I don't think it was especially great. Yeah, because I can't say like this is the first time I thought of it since I was there. So. I, I've played it a long <laughs> uh -huh. time ago. Yeah, yeah, it's been a while. Okay, what is next? I forget. Mm. Oh, is this going to be um, Metal Gear Rising Revengeance? I think it is, yeah. Now, okay, th this is legitimately a great game. It was, um, I mean, it was the biggest news coming out of this conference, don't you think? So, if I uh, Other than yeah, maybe, Karaoke. W wasn't this a situation when this was first shown, or is this the first? I don't think this is the first. I, can't remember. Uh, I believe that at they, least had been mentioned and announced before, because uh, I think people were expecting uh, this to show up. So, from what I recall, and I may be wrong, because it's been a while since I've thought about it, they first showed this game running on the Metal Gear Solid 4 engine, mm. de possibly developed in-house, and then at some point Platinum Games took over the development and basically rebooted it. Like, it was first just Metal Gear Rising, then I think it appeared as Metal Gear Rising Revengeance, and it was a different yes. thing. Because this looks more like Metal Gear Solid 4 uh, graphics engine, right? Right, the model and everything. The, the modeling, lighting, and everything, and they haven't yeah. mentioned Platinum Games yet. So I'm wondering if this was the original showing of this game? Zandatsu. Zandatsu. I love yeah. that. Um... So, yeah, that's a good question. We'll see this, if Platinum this, shows this up, had, but I can't remember. This did have a weird development history. I do remember that much. I mean, it's hard for me to say if it was announced or not, because I remember that I was working for publications at the time, so certain yeah, things yeah. were made aware to, I was being made aware of them earlier. But yeah, you see, Lightning yeah, Bolt yeah. Adventure. That's right. Lightning, lightning Bolt, bolt action. Ad action. Sorry. <laughs> Yes, this is the this is it. This is the original vision for it. Or there's like cutting through the scenery like this, like all over the place. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's right. With that, the analog uh, free free form yep. uh, cut action. Yeah. I mean, this looked awesome. Uh, I'm sitting there. I so this, you're right. This is so interesting then, because yeah, this this did well, not Kimo um, was the director, release so. in this form. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and it cuts the melon. Uh, now, the Platinum game still has these the Zandatsu mechanic, but it is a little bit different, and mm -hmm. it's not as robust as they're showing here. Probably for the better, I'd say, actually. Like, <laughs> as an overall game, I think for the better. I, mean, I think it became the game it needed to be. 
Yeah, big time. Mm -hmm. It got super cheesy, and the thing I love about Metal Gear Rising is just the music in implementation. Yes. The way they play these really intense music, and then like you're fighting a boss, and they, they fade in lyrics as you progress. And then by the time you get to the last section, it's just full out insanity. As someone might have saw, um, Mr. Kojima has passed me the torch for this project. Yeah, okay. I, I got to be, I got to go to the presentation of like this, and then subsequently Metal Gear Five, uh, Ground Zeroes, and then Metal Gear Five. I actually managed to go to all those presentations as the threes went on. And uh, Metal Gears were always kind of fun when they were announced because people were always excited for them and. Uh, you know, brought the room a little bit out here. You can see people are kind of a little bit more paying attention and happy oh, about yeah. this. Oh, yeah, so, th so this would have been the second time this game was shown then. It was first announced in 2009. In the trailer, yeah. you saw the concept word Zandatsu. Yeah, yeah okay. Man, what a, what a crazy scenario. Concept, uh, uh, no. It's It's uh, actually a made-up word, especially They're created really for this project. Do you think Raiden's uh, design here is better than the one he ended up with in uh, Platinum, though? Uh, I wouldn't say so. I mean, he looks really good in the Platinum game. His yeah. model is excellent. Man, I, I do like that, that game from Platinum. It's, uh, it's an interesting title. Yeah, I, I'm not a big fan of Metal Gear Solid 4. Uh, I was very uh, let down by that. For many reasons, and uh, Metal Gear Rising, Revengeance, whatever, um, I was really into because that was such a f quick and fun and snappy game. And uh, as I said, it was really the game it needed to be. Yeah, this was that period though where Metal Gear Solid kind of disappeared for a while between four and five. Mm -hmm. um, and I remember when they first re revealed Ground Zeroes and really showcased what they were doing with the Fox engine, and you could see. That's when they really nailed the gameplay design. Even if it kind of, you know, that is ultimately lacking in the storytelling area. Yeah, there's other aspects on 5 that's lacking, but uh, as a technical showpiece, it's uh, one of the finest of its era. Yeah, yeah. So this camera angle always makes it look like the guy behind the person speaking is just like staring into the back of their head. Yeah, pretty with much. Intensity. Yeah, right. That's very. Okay, there he looks out. This is um, kind of how you proceed in when the game. When you're standing on stage, um, I haven't been on the big stages, obviously, uh, but the small stages, uh, you can't really see much because the lights are very bright. So oh, I know that, yeah. Every time I'm on stage, it's that same feeling where yeah. you really can't see the audience, which actually kind of helps get your nerves up. It helps up. a lot, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, because you know, public speaking is something I don't necessarily find very intimidating personally, uh, but I know some people really do, and it does generally help the fact that the lights are usually so bright and so warm that you're on stage. You're really more thinking about just, man, I have to get done so I, you know, stop sweating because it's so incredibly exactly. hot. Uh, but you can't really see anyone, and this is why it kind of leads to a lot of like there in the headlights type looks, where it's just kind of like you're looking at bright lights and black. You know, there's nothing really to focus on because your eyes have to constantly move so they don't get, you know, flashed by the light so much. So another aspect of just kind of presentation that people don't think much about is just like those, these kind of conditions. Yeah, exactly. We're just pulling back all the curtains here so people know how this works. We're like the pen and teller of uh, video games, sharing Ooh, all the secrets. I like I like the sound of that. Or we're just full of bullshit. Oh, <laughs> well, maybe it's a bit of A, a little bit. Oh, it's a little bit from column A, a little bit from column B. <laughs> All right, Grandpa Simpson. <laughs> cut at will. I thought it was interesting that they cut the melon. It's very much a Metal Gear moment, like the ice cubes in Metal Gear 2. This kind of nonsensical display of, like, uh, everyday item being kind also, of realistically used. That was a, that was a uh, trademark, not trademark, but it was basically what Metal Gear or Kojima trailers would always end with uh, yes. something ridiculous, and they would constantly like they'd have fake endings. You'd see like a thing that's like okay, ending and title. Okay, here's another section. Oh, now there's like some other message on the screen, and then they have to show something else after that. And it's, they keep trying to sort of like extend that trailer to the absolute max and show goofy stuff at the end. 
I seem to recall, and I might, maybe this was just at an E3 or something, but I seem to recall there was one presentation of Metal Gear 4, Metal Gear Solid 4, where it ended on uh, Johnny Suzuki, Suzaki. Um, at least it ended up on him, like, pooping his pants in a barrel, and, like, that was the ending to the trailer. Um, oh, yeah. I thought that was the best representation of Metal Gear 4 I've ever seen. Masterclass editing from Ko uh, Kojima to get across the quality of that game. I mean, this is probably the best presented game in this conference, don't you think? In terms of just, like, explaining the uh, game, yeah. showcasing it. I mean, they, they're not showing much, uh, but this is still kind of what was to expect, be expected from Metal Gear, because Metal Gear is a game series where you have to start explaining, really, every aspect of it. Well, so yes, but I think if I recall at the time, the idea that this was... Uh, it wasn't directed by Kojima, and it just had the feeling of being sort of a side project. Mm-hmm. Um, which, so I don't think anybody viewed this as, oh, this is the next Metal Gear. It was like, okay, here's a spinoff. But I was still excited for it, nonetheless. Oh, yeah. I mean, it looked like an action game, really action-packed. And, you know, there, there was a lot of the, you saw in the trailer a little bit, like the physics, the realistic, like, physics of people, things falling down and crumbling and whatnot. It just looked like the game was very organic, which... Uh, it was one of the issues I had certainly before was just like how you know pedestrian and kind of straightforward everything was. What a weird game that was. Like the old uh, hero that we had. I mean, they're dedicating a lot of time to this naturally being. Yeah, yeah, it's the Metal, Metal Gear. Gear of the Year. I, like I said earlier, I wish they at the end of this they would have revealed that they're changing the company logo back to the bacon strips. Oh yeah. But I guess to do that you need you need to actually have the games to back it up. So do you remember the weird time when like Nintendo was changing their logo? It went from like uh red to white to silver and now I think it's back to red again. Or I guess now with oh. the, uh, the switch it's like red and then the logo is white. Um, yeah, but, red white is their current scheme. Mm -hmm. But I just remember that uh, working in, you know, eventually working for a game uh, company as a producer, when it came down to the guidelines for Nintendo, it was very important that you didn't mess up the colors. Obviously, a brand is a brand. So, but yeah, you're definitely right. They should have announced the return of the classic Konami logo. Should do it today. I agree. Konami at this time too, I mean, change. there was a lot of changes behind the scenes in terms of the direction the company was taking. We talked about it with the mobile games and stuff, but there was also Facebook gaming coming up. And this yeah, was I, going to be I a know. big part. I mean, I, as I mentioned, I had a lot of friends at Konami, um, uh, both from higher-ups and like in accounting. And, you know, the directions they were taking was just, you know, it was a lot of these casual gameplay styles like Facebook and the things that were emerging that people really thought was going to be the next thing. You know, companies like Zynga. Zynga was like buying up and picking up all the talent at the time. So it was a big deal. And Konami for the years to come. Uh, this conference is weird, yes. But let me just tell you that being there afterwards and seeing Konami, it didn't get better than this necessarily. Hey. And I would like to draw up to that's the right, uh, that's right. Raiden that we all know in MGS4. Okay, so they're going to show us Raiden, I think. Uh, okay, they talk about this. Well, I won't talk any more about the story because uh, I'm not allowed at this moment today. Uh, MGS Rising, I will assure you, no, will be something different, just totally kind of hanging out. That old logo there from Metal Gear Solid Rising, mm -hmm. that's interesting. I guess the final game is called Metal Gear Rising, not Metal Gear Solid Rising. Right. Was it called Lightning With Revenge Bolt Action, though? I don't think so. Did they, keep, did they retain that? I don't think they did, but I oh, could bad. be wrong. So I love that lightning bolt action. I want to retroactively now make it a rule that it has to be added back to the game's name. It is Metal Gear Solid Rising Lightning Bolt Action Revengeance. <laughs> Revengeance was such a funny word. Oh, I uh, love it. Uh, I remember Capcom did a Resident Evil game eventually, which was like 
revelations. Like it was go supposed to be like revelations or something, but they screwed up the spine. But oh yeah, on the first print, love the first print run. Of, yeah. <laughs> Do you have that? Do you have that version? Yeah, I have that. I have that oh, version. Oh, all right, all right. Do you have the Loin think, King? So I don't think Loin King actually got printed. No, I don't think so either. There. Like that. That was shown in an early like box shot. It was oh, Loin yes. King. Look at this. So this is interesting because I think this game was done on a super low budget, uh, but it's a really interesting concept. And I actually did play this with friends quite a bit back in the day, and I remember having a lot of fun with it. Again, a game really out of its era, or out of its element, sorry, uh, for Konami, because no one really was looking for this game other than hardcore fans. Well, I mean, and the thing is, though, is this wasn't a normal Castlevania game at no, all, no, obviously. Not, not it was so all. different, but it was a really interesting take on Castlevania, so I enjoyed it. One of the it. last of the classic takes yep. uh, of this, and... Again, this is kind of part of their mobile push, I think. I mean, this isn't a mobile game, but this is the idea of doing lower budget games on downloadable platforms because they had this game. Uh -huh. uh, there was also the other one, which is the hardcore, um, the Contra Hardcore follow up. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Hardcore um, Uprising? Uh, uh, Uprising, yeah. You had that, and then eventually you had like New Russian Attack. So, oh, yeah. I mean, this was something that they kept doing. They were trying to maintain their classic franchises a little yeah. bit more than... So... You got, you got Ashi, you, one of his last here, I'd actually like to see this game return, but, like, with support for 4K output. Oh, it Because that whole zoom-out function that they use, which is really cool, like, that would benefit from a super high pixel count. We were talking about Hudson earlier. You know, they should have announced that HD uh, Bomberman from the 90s. Do you remember that? Oh, yeah. High 10 Bomberman. <laughs> yeah. High 10 Bomberman. Dude, I would love 4K Bomberman. Yes. Like, a, you, you know, Tetris 99, right? But mm -hmm. Bomberman is what I'm talking yeah. about here. Like, I want to see that. <laughs> they, they did bring Bomberman back, though, because now we have that Super oh, Bomberman yeah, yeah, yeah. R, which is uh, after right. being patched. It's uh, quite a good game. Yeah, it's very decent. But I still it's want Bomberman 99. It's interesting to see Iga here, though. I don't know how many more years he stayed on board at Konami. Uh, at this point, he was really not uh, at two good graces, I think, with the company. Though I can't speak for him. Uh, I mean, yeah, I'm, we don't know personally what was going on within no, Konami. But based on his output at this point, it's kind of, you kind of get the impression that he wasn't being given the budgets to do what he may have wanted to do, maybe? If we if we look at what he kickstarted, then like it's obviously he still wanted to try and do that type of game and yeah, I think uh, Konami as a company was probably pushing more towards you know for a Castlevania game I mean, they were pushing more towards a cinematic, character driven game like they got with Lords of Shadow. Um, whereas I, I think Iga is someone that's more comfortable in more solid, retro foundational mechanics, but um, he. I met him a few times. I don't know him very well personally or anything, but uh, he's still a very nice guy and he's extremely tall for a Japanese person. So, and always wears the hat, by the way. <laughs> I love that. That's so great. <laughs> and leather pants. I don't think I've ever seen him without leather it pants is, on. It is interesting. At the time when he was doing the GBA and eventually the DS games for Castlevania, mm -hmm. it seemed like they were coming out with like sort of a regular frequency people are starting to think oh geez it's another one of these but looking back uh i kind of regret that line of thinking because man we had it good right like these amazing 2d pixel art castlevania games releasing that often and they're mm -hmm. all good like some are better than others but man what a time you don't know what you have until you lost it right so yeah precisely yeah. So please help I mean, this game. It, it was exciting for me. This is my first E3, right? And I'm sitting up in the corners here somewhere. And just, you know, I had been in the industry for six years at this point. And I had already been meeting some of my heroes in the industry and worked with them even. And, you know, I had been fortunate. But here I was sitting at this conference in Los Angeles. I was seeing Castlevania on the big screen. I was seeing Iga here. And just kind of, I was... I was a bit kind of like, you know, just in a bit of bliss, gaming bliss. The fact that I had kind of made it here from my little town. So That's right. It, when I'm watching this now too, as I said, I never watched this feed. And yes, there are awkward moments. But uh, when I'm watching this right now, I'm kind of filled with uh, warmth 
of just kind of returning there. And uh, it was a special time. It was a special time in gaming, too. It was a turbulent time, but there was stuff like this happening that uh, we today, you know, reminisce that we would like to uh, bring back, you know, Castlevania HD. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so, Lords of Shadow, um, I think we've talked about this before. I think it's a very well-made sort of uh, Devil May Cry slash God of War style third-person combat action game. Character action Ma game, yeah. Yeah, I, uh, I have a soft spot for it. And I think it's interesting that this is the sort of... It makes sense at the time to try to reboot Castlevania in this way, mm -hmm. at least in the consoles. So I don't fault them for trying. And I think they did a fairly good job overall. But uh, obviously, this is not the future I wanted for the series long term. Yeah, I think this is the issue people have, though, when it comes to stuff like this. That this, you know, this is the new future. And kind of my biggest problem with games like Lord of Shadow and whatnot is that you know, my favorite aspect of the Castlevania game is probably the music. And uh, they just never held up as well. They have good music, don't get me wrong. Uh, lots, lots of respect to the people working on it. But a Castlevania game just needs to nail that soundtrack. And uh, you know, they are basically, you know, you know, classic horror movie compilations. And, you know, as someone that's really into, like, 30s and 40s style horror, you know, they, they're fun for me to play on the NES with all these monsters showing up and the the music being kind of up, you know, action-y and upbeat and pumping adrenaline into my blood. And something like Lord of Shadow, uh, something that happened a lot with this era is just that I felt like it was such a pro plotting, just kind of like, as I said, it was just the colors and everything was a bit muted for me. Well, uh, you're right in most games, but not with Lords of Shadow. Lords of Shadow is a very colorful game. Like yeah, far more you're so right, than actually. The uh, second one, on the other hand, is super dull and grim in comparison with this first yeah, game. I, I think was this is really the issue. colorful and, and, and beautiful at the time. I was going to just mention that, like, for me, uh, the second game and the first game just kind of blend together a bit. Uh, the, uh, they did, uh, I mean, Mercury Stream on handheld, I think, is a pretty good company. I mean, this is also a good game, don't get me wrong. But it did have that DS game. Uh, based on yeah, Ultra Shadow, 3DS. Which, yeah, that was yeah. okay. And then they which did better with Metroid 2 Return of Samus. Which is a very good game. I know some of the hardcore fans don't like it as much, but I think that's one flaws, of the best Metroid, well Metroid games. Yeah. Something I, mean, I loved it, about this game, though, is the long journey to the castle. Like To yes. get to Dracula's castle, it's pretty much half the game, and it's a pretty lengthy game, so it felt like a journey, similar to Castlevania 4 in some ways. Yes, I think they nailed that too. I mean, uh, they probably looked at that when designing it. Is that every Castlevania game is a journey? First one is the third one when you you know meet comrades, pick them up along the way, decide your path, all leading up to that castle. And as you mentioned, uh, the fantastic Super Castlevania Four. So I mean, you have to. That's the aspect you have to nail alongside the music is that journey to the castle, and then when you get to the ca castle. It's always that long staircase into the Hall of Dracula because it's all <laughs> yeah. setting up. It's all setting up that confrontation throughout the entire game. That's what you you know you know what you're going up against, and you're just you know supposed to be dreading that moment because it's going to be the most difficult yet. And uh, yeah, this game does a good job at uh, getting that across. I mean, when I, I say I'll... that this is my favorite, or like it's not to say that this is a bad game at all. I'm just comparing it to the classic. Sure, Castle yeah, game. it's very different. It's its own yeah. thing. I will say, though, that uh, I was always a big fan of the ending and its ridiculousness. Yes. <laughs> you know, where he basically right, becomes, yes. he becomes basically Dracula. And, uh, you know, it sort of cuts to that post credit sequence, I think, where he's, like, uncovered in, in this, like, sort of chapel and engages in a battle. I don't remember the exact details other than him being thrown through a stained glass window and mm -hmm. lands out on the streets of a modern city. Yes. And I love that. It's like, oh, okay. <laughs> There's other aspects of this too that kind of it harkens back to the original because a lot of the designs of the bosses and the enemies are taken from like horror movies. You even saw like the uh, kind of dreadful uh, Fred Coppola. Oh, stuff. look at Dracula that. Patrick Stewart. The the Patrick Stewart or Zobeck. Yeah. Oh, man. Jason Isaacs. This, this is a game, unfortunately, that had a lot of technical performance issues in its original form, so hmm. playing it on PC 
which was released later, is like the way to go because you can enjoy it at a smooth 60 FPS. It looks great. Is there any game from the PS3, Xbox 360 era that hasn't been given a PC port that you really wish they did? Like that the performance is just so bad and it's locked to that console? Um, not that it's locked. Uh, not that the performance is bad and the game is flawed, but I always wanted a conversion of Metal Gear Solid 4 elsewhere. Mm -hmm. Oh, I see. Okay. Because it's basically stuck on the on the PS3, and it has that. I guess you could install the whole game now, which is cool, but still. I, I never want to play that game again. <laughs> I think it's super flawed, but there's some interesting stuff in there. The thing that always comes to my mind, though, is the when you go back to Shadow Moses, mm -hmm. and they start by introducing it with old school PS1 graphics. Oh, the best is yet to come comes yeah, out. Yeah, that was a that was a really nice moment, and then you end up going there like within the actual new game and but post the events of Metal Gear Solid 1 and it's a it's a touching moment I, I thought it was neat oh, oh yeah, yeah I these think uh, all the, Metal, uh, Kojima's writing I think it's just all over the place I can't yeah, really it's get into pretty that. crazy in that as a writer myself which is kind of this but. uh these colossi battles were interesting as well yes What's weird is that this game is like a variety show in that it's level based rather than or like chapter based, I guess. Mm -hmm. But there's no like uh, you don't move seamlessly between just each chapter. They're all bespoke, which is like both. It has a downside, but at the same time, it also means that they can completely change everything per chapter. So each chapter has its own sort of theme and visual style, and they really go to a lot of crazy places. Well, they which, did that with uh, in retrospect uh, is really 4. cool. Uh, more so than that, like it's yeah. really like really different per chapter. It doesn't mm -hmm. always even make sense, but it's kind of fun from a game perspective. So, all right. Have you seen the uh, TV yeah. show, by the way? Castlevania. Oh Netflix yeah, show? that's really good, isn't it? Yeah, I love that show. You may have heard the news, but I'm Great happy show. to confirm that Konami also have a five right franchise title currently planning for Nintendo 3DS. That's funny. Contra, Frogger, Baseball, and of course, Metal Gear Solid. We will have more announcements coming soon, so stay tuned. Okay, that concludes our E3 press conference. Yes, Thank you all for joining us there, today. As you can see. We oh, hope yeah, you enjoyed the presentation. Go. Thank well, you. So there it was. Uh, we survived the conference. Well, and it's fun seeing it. It's fun to see it again. Looking back, uh, all the fun, funny moments that people kind of remember, there's not actually that many, and really the conference is generally fairly boring. It's very straightforward. Uh, as I said, my memory of it, you know, was sitting there. So for me, it was just kind of like another conference with some funny moments, and I have seen much worse, and I've been part of much worse uh, since. <laughs> so, uh, and I, I can be blamed for much worse since. So, no, no, I mean, this to me is a fine conference, and it's not the best, but it is the best that Konami could offer at this point, I think, because of the internal changes and what was to come. And I think that the reason it's so infamous is there's a lot of flubs, there's a lot of awkward moments, and then the actual game lineup that they brought to the show. Uh, in retrospect, there's some decent stuff there at the end, but it's overall rather poor, or at least it doesn't really line up with the audience or Konami fans expectations I guess I mean there's yeah. just it's a complex issue but Konami in 2010 just they were heading into the downward spiral but it did end you know we saw at the end there it ends with a Metal Gear game and it ends with a Castlevania game so it still was Konami I That's mean true. you still get the there was, there was still Konami. some of it there uh, kind yeah. of I mean <laughs> those were pretty different <laughs> games but still I think that's going to do it for this one, so thanks for joining me, Audi. Oh, it was really fun. I really appreciated this. Of course, and if you guys enjoyed watching this video, well, first, be sure to let us know that you survived this one then, because making it to the end of the <laughs> Konami conference again, it's almost kind of an achievement in and of itself, so well done. Uh, but also, while you're here, be sure to like and subscribe and all that goodness. You know, follow us over on Twitter and everything else, and until next time, stay retro. <laughs>